All right, hello and welcome. My name is Andrea Himoff. I am the Executive Director of Action Utah, a nonpartisan community engagement organization that was involved in the development and passage of a climate resolution for Utah called HCR7, the House Concurrent Resolution on Environmental and Economic Stewardship. Now, we are streaming this event live for people who weren't able to attend today. Um, and on our Facebook streams, on our uh, sponsor pages, um, check Action Utah, Heal Utah, or Citizens Climate Lobby on Facebook for the stream. We're also posting links uh, to our paperless materials for this conference. So you can go ahead and check the links for HCR 7's resolution language and for a handout on some of the concepts that we're going to be discussing today. So. Um, before we get started, I really wanted to do a little bit of background on what HCR 7 is and how it came about. Starting in 2010, when the Utah State Legislature passed a resolution for Utah that used words like climate gate and encouraged the EPA to cease all activity reducing emissions uh, of carbon dioxide. That's where we started out. At that time, the word climate change was politically toxic. Um, it was very difficult for decision makers to engage the issue in this Republican supermajority state. Thus, when a climate resolution was introduced in 2018, very few people thought it had any legs at all. Um, you know, let alone did they think that it would become the first climate resolution in a red state in America. But what they didn't know is that HCR 7 didn't begin that first day of the legislative session in January 2018. It really started two years before in a northern Utah city of Logan, where a group of high school students felt frustrated by the lack of climate action in their community and reached out to their city council to pass a climate resolution. They had formed an environmental club, um, they had boned up on their climate science, and they were successful passing this resolution. And once they were, they aimed their sights a little higher. And they reached out to a state senator named Jim DeBacchus to run a statewide climate resolution for Utah in 2017. Now this resolution got no attention in the state legislature and didn't even get a, a hearing. But Senator DeBacchus was so impressed with these students that he held his own public hearing and invited state legislators to attend. Now, two of the legislators who attended were also so impressed with the students that they decided to take this resolution and give it a second chance in 2017. They renamed it, they rewrote it, they filed it really fast, they got it a, climb, uh, excuse me, a committee hearing, and they received a tie vote. Now, unfortunately, a tie vote in Utah means that the resolution failed, but it was major progress. And the progress led to this Republican sponsor committing to running it again in 2018 and to a series of advocacy organizations teaming up to join that effort and in 2018 a new resolution was proposed. A new strategy was put in place, the new resolution had new language, teams of people were mobilized to help out, and though the outcome was far from certain, we knew that the work we had done to get the resolution that far had already started to change the conversation on climate change here in Utah. Passing the resolution was simply a major bonus. And by the time it passed, we knew that although each of us was a major critical cog in the HCR 7 wheel, that it was really absolutely core that these high school students were involved from Logan High School and were joined by students from West High School here in Salt Lake City and college students from Utah State University to create one of the most successful youth-led initiatives in the state. So I wanna introduce our panelists today. These panelists all worked intimately on HCR 7. Um, they are here to share the framework and story of HCR 7 so that we can use that to inform our work on climate solutions and discuss four key strategic concepts. We'll also be inviting the audience to participate along the way to hear from you about your work, your ideas, and your strategies so we can all leave today feeling not only enriched and inspired, but also with specific ideas from each other for how to move forward on climate in our own communities. So, uh, let me start over here uh, to my, what is this side? To my right.
right is Jessica Reimer. I know who you are. <laughs> Jesse is a policy associate at the Healthy Environment Alliance of Utah, more commonly known as um, Heal Utah. She leads Heal's air quality campaign, developing solutions at the intersection of air quality, climate change, and public health. Jesse is one of the authors of HCR 7 and other critical writings around the initiative. And she was a member of the professional lobbying team who spoke directly with legislators about HCR 7. To her right is Piper Christian. Piper is the his heroic uh, student from Logan High School. I was going to call you historic, but you also <laughs> are. Who founded the Environmental Club, convinced her fellow students to join her, passed a city climate resolution, and led the student effort to pass the climate resolution in the state of Utah. Along the way, Piper has spoken at a series of uh, events on climate around the country, including giving a TEDx talk and an awesome keynote address at the Citizens Climate Lobby Conference in Washington, D.C. Piper is currently a sophomore at uh, University of Utah and continues to work to engage students in climate policy from the local to the national level. And finally, Tom Moyer is a robotics engineer and climate activist. He is the state coordinator for the Utah Citizens Climate Lobby, which is also known as CCL. He's a leader at Climate Utah, which lobbies at the Utah legislature. Tom trains and mobilizes community members to become citizen climate activists using CCL's tried and true bipartisan method, and he is a master of conversing with anyone from any ideological background on climate. <laughs> so starting there, uh, we would like to begin by talking about the first key strategic concept that we used to pass HCR 7, which is starting with a clear goal. Far beyond having a cause that you believe in, it is critical to define your strategic long-term and short-term goals. What exactly do you believe in? Why? Do you want to change policy? Do you want to get publicity? Do you want to stand your ground and plant a flag? Or do you want to compromise and why? Where will you engage this goal? In your school or institution, in your local area and community, your region, your state, the nation? These are what we call the what, the why, and the where. So let me start with the panelists and ask each of you, what were your specific goals going into HCR 7? Can we start with you, Piper? Yes. Can you hear me okay? Let me move this up. Thank you, Andrea. So, can everyone hear me all good? Okay. Just to reiterate what um, Andrea had mentioned, as a sophomore in high school, I and my environmental club introduced a resolution on climate change and clean air to our city council. And this resolution we were excited to find passed unanimously. But So what was our goal? We wanted to create a common understanding in Utah that climate change does exist and that our elected leaders should take action to address it. But while our city council was very receptive to our discussions on climate change, we discovered that our state legislature had a long history of climate denial. So as Andrea mentioned, in 2010, the Utah State Legislature passed a resolution that urged the Environmental Protection Agency to cease all CO2 reduction policies until climate science had been substantiated. Specifically, they stated that our global climate was actually cooling and that action to address climate change would lock billions into long-term poverty. So this was the consensus among our state legislature. As students, we had witnessed the way climate change had already impacted our state through reduced snowpack and increased heat waves in the summers. And we believed that this sense, this denial of science, truly endangered our future as youth. So we introduced our own resolution on climate change, and I wanna just highlight a few of the things that it talked about. It recognized the impacts of a changing climate on Utah citizens, it expressed commitment to finding climate solutions, it encouraged a reduction in emissions. And what we really believed was that the by creating a common understanding that our resolution would be the bedrock for future climate policies within our state. Tom, how about you? So we do, as Citizens Climate Lobby, we do most of our work with our federal delegation. and We've been focused on passing federal legislation. We have a bill in Congress now, H.R. 763. It's the first bipartisan climate bill in a decade. And we were at the time engaged in bringing uh, Republicans and Democrats together into um, a climate solutions caucus in Congress. 
and when we started working on this, we had just had our first member of the Utah delegation, that was Mia Love, join the Climate Solutions Caucus. And it was pretty clear that, that this is a step-by-step -step process, that nobody's gonna be willing to get too far out in front of their colleagues by themselves. And so for us, the goal was just get our federal delegation some support at the state level. We don't have to pass anything. We just need some prominent Republicans at the state level to start talking about climate change in, in solutions-oriented conversations. So we were just starting to feel out our state legislators uh, during the time when, when Piper and the other high school students introduced this. And then, quickly, this, it, uh, so I mean, the first thought was not like we could pass this. The first thought was, let's just try to get a vote or two. <laughs> <laughs> and then over the next year, it became, let's pass this. So actually, that brings up a question. How many of us who worked on it thought it was going to pass when we started the legislative session? You mean the year that it passed? January 2018. None of us. No expectations. <laughs> 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 All right. So, Jesse, how about you? Yeah. So. Um, I had just started working for the Healthy Environment Alliance of Utah, or Heal Utah at that time, and was honestly just ecstatic to be able to work on something related to climate. It was kind of my first foray into policy, and it was my first legislative session here in Utah, and had grown up here knowing that the environment was kind of a contentious issue up at the legislature, and so wasn't quite sure how it would be received, how a climate resolution would be received, kind of like we just all acknowledged didn't have a whole lot of hope. However, um, working for an environmental advocacy organization, we saw the opportunity to, like Piper mentioned, lay the groundwork or the foundation for future legislation, future policy, even just future community efforts related to climate. And you know, living in Utah where we are in a high desert, we have issues with water, we have issues with drought, wildfires, there's so many different things tied to the environment and the community here and so we were just really kind of thinking about this over the long term and you know what can we be achieving down the line if we could get something like this passed as a resolution now okay so if you were to articulate your what your why and your where what would you say oh the the what was the resolution you know mm -hmm. we wanted to get the resolution passed knowing that that was the important foundational piece of legislation um, the why was that longer term goal of how can we make a, take action on climate in a state that is conservative and generally doesn't have the environment at the forefront of what they're thinking about when passing policy. And the where was the Utah State Legislature. Okay, okay how about for you, Piper? Can you do the what, the where, and the why? Yeah, um, I think similarly the what was. Um, Honestly, but my what was a little bit. Do you use a mic, please? Oh, happy to, yes. Thank you. Um, I think the what for us students was, um, again, we didn't initially foresee it passing. So the what was the opportunity to engage students in politics and in the state legislature. We've had a lot of people tell us, wait till you graduate high school to get involved in the legislature. Um, the why was because uh, I was in high school during a very uh, hostile political climate and I saw my peers feel very disenfranchised and so I wanted to give them an opportunity to actively engage and the where was the state legislature. Great, and then Tom, can you do the same thing? Sure. So the what was some, some prominent backup for our federal delegation mm -hmm. and the, uh, the why is because that's a critical step in the chain before we can actually get to passing something. And the where is, I mean, we've been engaged with businesses as well and, and municipalities, but at the time, the where was the state legislature. Awesome. Okay, so now that we've heard from the panelists, I would like to hear from some of the people in the audience about some of their, some of your goals. If you have a clear what, where, and why, great. If you don't, can you articulate what it is that uh, even a, a sort of blanket goal might be in this realm? I've got a uh, microphone here that I'll bring around to anybody who wants to participate. Anybody want to chime in with what your specific goals are? All right, here you go. I'll chime in. My name is Aaron. Um, our uh, near term goal is a lighting ordinance in Sandy City. Um, the why is because 
currently it's outdated and a more appropriate uh, there, there's more appropriate lighting policies as people become more aware and educated on the topic and that's in Sandy City um, but that's also a regional thing so right here in Salt Lake County. Great, anybody else? My name is Eric uh, Robertson. I'm from the uh, Honors College at the University of Utah. I think the what for us is this notion of trying to get the student work, the research that they do, um, to have a particular environmental time. Uh, we're working very hard in the Honors College with uh, developing particular minors that are highly interdisciplinary. So the one that we have now that is up and running is Ecology and Legacy, so that Almost every topic that a student would want to research as, a, as an honors thesis or in the classes that I teach, which are the writing classes, the writing and research classes, that there's some sort of tie in that says, look, you don't want that thesis to just sit in some dusty book in some dean's office. That, so we're, I think the what is how do you take that into a civic engagement? How do you take your topic, regardless of what it is, because there really isn't any topic, whether it be social justice or economics or anything, that does not have, and in my estimation, should always have some sort of environment to tie in. Uh, otherwise, what is your research doing? So that's the what. Obviously the why is, uh, and I've been doing some of this as well, my generation, the Gen Xers, half of us are, sitting around not doing anything making things worse and half of us are really trying but we're still kind of stuck and so i think the why is uh, piper's generation is going to have to raise children in this environment uh, they're going to have to take care of us uh, they're going to have to do all of these things so the why is uh, how do we prepare then that other generations, particularly within the classroom. So for me, it's higher ed, in, in, in the classroom in higher ed, with the undergraduate experience. I prefer working with under, undergraduates because uh, people like Piper tend to have a little more, uh, I don't know, fire in their belly uh, than, than some of the graduate students I've encountered. And I'm sure I was a graduate student that was mostly in my head instead of on the ground. Um, and then I, the, the, the place to engage it is in the classroom. How can we always, in some way, engage students um, and show them that here are organizations that you can step outside of this classroom and go with this topic that you're writing about with this tie-in that we're helping you to develop and say, here, use me. How can, I, how can I operate with this topic within this environmental context? Awesome. So you're aware as undergraduate classrooms, can we be specific in Utah or at well, specific yeah. universities? So, yeah, so for me, it's it's at the, uh, the Honors College and at uh, the University of Utah. But I think this is, I think this can be true for any undergraduate classroom. I think that too often uh, we teach subjects that are separate from any kind of civic application. And academia, I think, is in a bit of a crisis mode, particularly within the humanities, of how do we apply what we learn in the classroom so that it has some sort of import in the world at, at large. And so that's kind of, so I think any undergraduate classroom would benefit from, from that kind of a process. Can we do one more before we move along? Anybody else want to talk about their goals, specific goals? Yeah, I'm also from the University of Utah, Danielle Andrees. Um, and our president, Ruth Watkins, just signed a carbon neutral by 2050. And so I've been placed on this task force to kind of help implement that at the University of Utah. And so um, that is our what, carbon neutral uh, 2050. The why, University of Utah is a huge contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. It's a huge employer, so um, we hope that it can make a big difference. And then where is University of Utah? Okay, so now that we've talked about um, some of these specific goals, let's talk about how we talk about these goals, how we talk, what words we use, what words we avoid, um, who is the person who's going to be most influential in conveying, oops, went the wrong way, who's gonna be most influential in conveying this information? Uh, what is your language? Um, why do the people who oppose your effort oppose it? What words are they using to oppose? Or why do they support it? What are the words they're using to 
support your effort that you need to engage in order to make sure they maintain their support. So my question to the panel is, let me find my question. How did word choice matter? And how did you approach conversations with decision makers about HCR7 on messaging? So we, we spend a lot of time as CCL talking to our members and training our members on how to talk to, to legislators about this, and it's really difficult. The more I've done this, the more I've realized that this is kind of a lot like middle school, <laughs> where nobody wants to do something alone. They're happy to do it in a group. So as we talked to Republican legislators from Utah, I was shocked to find out how little opposition there is to the known science, that's not the problem. The problem is who wants to go first? So we, we finally, after a year of, of meetings, uh, had somebody, I mean a lot, willing to step up and say, I will lead on this issue. And so she joined the Climate Solutions Caucus, she wrote an op-ed about climate change in the Deseret News, she brought up climate change unprompted on the floor of the Utah legislature, but still, every step is, I don't want to get too far out ahead of my colleagues. I don't want to get too far out ahead of my constituents. You got to bring other people along with me in doing this. So, so it's always a, yes, we want to use your voice as much as we can, and we want to get you the backup so you're not taking big risks for yourself. We want to help you, and we want you to help us. Um, in terms of messaging, um, as students, we wanted to have an opportunity to speak one-on-one -on -one with our legislators um, about climate change in a non-threatening setting. And the reason we wanted to do that was we wished to build relationships so that they understood that we were friends and not adversaries. If the only time a legislator sees you is in a hearing or, or something like that, um, you know, you may not be really doing the right groundwork. You have to build a relationship. So to accomplish this, we organized an event in the Capitol in which a panel of leaders in science, technology, business, and education talked about climate solutions. And one of Utah's former Republican congressional representatives, Mia Love, who Tom mentioned, um, gave a virtual statement about why she supported climate solutions. But the most important part of this event was that after the presentation, over 30 students had one-on-one -on -one conversations with their legislators about climate change. And this was such an incredible opportunity, both for the students and legislators. And what was so interesting was that some of the most vocal climate-denying legislators in our state stayed for the entire event, something we've never seen before. And while many in the room strongly disagreed around the issues of climate change, we created a setting where everyone felt heard. Well, in terms of, of messengers and um, how you're communicating, I think that one of the most important messengers that we learned turned out to be Piper and the high school students. Um, it's something that I think that um, as the environmental kind of lobbying group, we weren't quite sure how that would play out. And like I mentioned, this was my first year working at the legislature. I didn't have the full context of what had happened the year before. I had just kind of heard the stories, but hadn't met Piper, hadn't met any of the high school students, didn't really know um, how amazing they actually were. And so, you know, just a quick anecdote, we were sitting in um, the House Natural Resources Committee, which is a committee infamous for environmental bills going to essentially die. And so we were just very on edge. We were, we had kind of tried to line up speakers who we thought would be good um, messengers for the, the legislators themselves. Um, and a, a number of students came to speak. I think there were maybe 10, 10 or 15 students that wanted to say something. And all of us who were there, kind of that were on the lobbying team working, we were like, oh no, like, what is, how is this all gonna play out? And it turned out to be, amazing like the students were so incredibly um, prepared they were respectful they had the right tone and used the right words and it ended up just being a perfect um, a perfect complement to everything all the other work that we had been doing and I think that honestly if we had gone up there we would have been the ones to kill the bill <laughs> so um, I think that it's a testament to just those messengers are so incredibly important and um, 
knowing when to speak and knowing when to shut up are two very important and different things. So Jesse, you used a comment, they said the right words. So can you speak more to words being an author of the resolution and how the messages mattered as much as the messengers? Yeah, so um, when we first got the resolution, when it was going to be run with Becky Edwards as the main um, legislative lead, um, Carrie, who also works with Andrea at Action Utah, she and I basically took it one day and went to a coffee shop and said, okay, how can we make this something that will be, you know, have a good appetite here in Utah? And the way that we did that was we got onto the LDS uh, Church's website and looked up their statement on environmental stewardship. And we essentially pulled key words from that statement to include in the language so it was something that was, you know, being in Utah, we have a primarily LDS um, legislature. So these are words that they had heard before in the context that they're familiar with. And those words were stewardship. They were things like um, prudent management of natural resources, um, focusing on families and the effects that families will feel if the environment is not taken care of, um, focusing on the science behind that. And then the one that we thought was, we kind of got the biggest kick out of um, of all of them was taking out the words climate change and shifting it to a changing climate. And believe it or not, that little swap was key to it passing, because had those words climate change been in there, there would have been a lot more of that initial like, ooh, like we're not touching that. Um, but we kind of softened it a little bit. <laughs> and I will say that the, the substance of the resolution lost nothing right. in those changes. Um, Jesse mentioned that Piper was an excellent messenger, and not only Piper, all of the students who participated in this initiative. Who were some of the other important messengers on HCR 7 that we used? Um, I think it's just essential to highlight um, Republican Representative Becky Edwards. Um, if we were truly going to connect with conservative legislators, they needed to hear their, our message from a trusted source. And so we were extraordinarily fortunate to have Representative Edwards sponsor our bill both in 2017 and 2018. And she became our top advocate from the inside in the legislature. She had countless conversations with her colleagues to ask them how we could gain their support, something we couldn't necessarily do because we didn't have that relationship. She spoke to committee chairs to ensure that our resolution was given ample time to be discussed in legislative hearings. And as a Republican, she let us know how to best phrase our resolution so that it was appealing to her colleagues. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay. And I know you mentioned Mia Love already, Tom, and how important it was, and you as well, Piper, how important it was to have her speak up and be a face for climate change as well from a congressional level. So, Tom, you are an expert in non-threatening climate conversations. And we thought it could be fun to do a little bit of an exercise with the audience here to teach you some of the CCL ways of how to have conversations on things that are difficult. So let me let you take over and uh, teach us a little bit about that. Thank you. I don't know if I'm going to claim the mantle of expertise here. <laughs> always dangerous to think you're good at something. <laughs> Next thing you know, you fall on your face. But uh, I would like to teach you, this is an exercise we've done in CCL. We practice things like this a lot to get people in the right mindset. And I will tell you that no one gets it right all the time. I screw this up plenty, and I hopefully learn every time I screw it up. So, you're often in in a conversation about climate change where the person wants to be confrontational with you. This might be your uncle at Thanksgiving dinner, it might be me at the state Republican convention. <laughs> when they object, we connect. When they cast blame, we reframe. The idea here is you're gonna find a way in any conversation to find something you agree on. It's so easy when they object to you to object back to them. It doesn't work. So reframing is proposing a fresh perspective that engages us to build a better future together. Starts with finding where you have common values. What are the things you can find to agree on? It seems obvious, but step one is listening to them. 
right? It's very easy to answer them. It's very hard to listen to them. If that takes more time, so be it. Ask them a few questions. Why, why do you think that? Why do you feel that way? And discover what, what concerns and what values are reflected in that, and I bet you you will find something in there that you agree on together with anybody, regardless of where they are in, your, in the political spectrum. And join them. Find out whatever they have in their values that you agree with them on. And if there's nothing about climate and nothing about the environment, then find out what football team you both root for. <laughs> Somewhere you'll find something you agree on, and if that's all you manage in that conversation, that's a win. If you can find something to agree on, then you add momentum and use their energy as a resource to move forward. And then you're gonna propose a better frame to look at it together based on your shared values, and then you're gonna to come to your response only at that point, the thing you wanted to do first. With mutual respect. Okay, so here's what this looks like. They object. You don't respond. They say, I'll never work with Republicans or Democrats. You can't trust them. The response you want to give is, oh, we just have to give bipartisan support. What you will actually do is take a deep breath, ask a little more, figure out what you agree on, which in this case, we both value trust and integrity. So how do we go forward from there? In this climate of low trust, everyone is suspicious and policies don't pass. Somehow we need to restore authentic trust. Once you've agreed on that, then you can talk about how you build bipartisanship together. So, listen more deeply, join with them where you can, propose a better frame, and then respond within the new frame. So we're gonna practice this here. I'm gonna have you pair off for groups of three and do this. I'm gonna give you a couple of scenarios. If your first answer is yes, or I agree, then you're doing it right. It almost doesn't matter what happens after that. You can wing it from there. If your first answer is no, you're messed up, then you're doing it wrong. So, four possible uh, objections from them. It doesn't matter what my country does. We're a tiny share of the world's emissions. It's all about China or India or whatever. Two, this is big government, the any state telling me what to do. Three, your emissions reduction plan is gonna destroy the economy. Oops, and that meant to say four. Changing energy sources will drive up prices and hurt the poor. Access to energy is vital for reducing human suffering. So I'm gonna have, now I'm gonna let you guys pick. <laughs> you, you pick your favorite of those four. So find a partner next to you, choose one, and I want you both to practice it. So the objector is gonna say that, and then you are going to start with the word yes. And after that, you're gonna find what about their sentence you could agree with. Then you're gonna propose a frame to move forward, and you might even ask them a question in that process, and then you're gonna give the response. Go ahead. Do you have one you want? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So why don't you guys do it together? Okay. And uh, we can show the people who are watching live what that might look like. Okay. Like, and how hard it can be, but also that you can practice. Maybe the two of you can do it together. Okay. Tom, you want to pick one for us? Sure. Changing energy sources will drive up prices and more access to energy is vital for reducing human suffering. It's going to hurt the poor. Energy hurting the poor. Yes, it's going to hurt the poor. Anything you, do, anything you do on climate is going to crush the poor. Okay. Anything we do on climate is going to crush the poor. Yes, I agree that a lot of times when environmentalists talk about new climate policies, they sometimes leave out those who are experiencing poverty in the equation. So I agree that it's important that we prioritize those experiencing poverty. Um, are there any particular energy policies you've seen that have taken those in poverty into consideration? That's a very good question. When it comes to renewables, no. 
<laughs> I agree. Renewables do frequently. We need base load power. <laughs> and renewables are not going to get us there. Uh, yes, I understand that sometimes trying to find a solution that works can be really challenging with renewables. So, what other energy sources do you feel provide that base load power? Well, I do feel like there's some in the traditional energy sources, um, but recognize that maybe there's some way that we can bring in lower income communities into that conversation um, regarding just the need to keep the lights on and, and working towards um, including them in the conversation. That's wonderful. Are you familiar with some of the programs that communities have introduced to include those in poverty and new energy infrastructure? Yeah. Would it be okay if I share some stories? Absolutely. Great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good job. So I like having asked a few questions. Yeah, you turned me off there. <laughs> yeah. No, it's really, it's so easy to just say, I don't know the answer. Right. Uh, I'm impressed. You did a really good job. That was very good. I think Piper's so, practiced before. When you these questions, every single one of those objections, there's a piece of that. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. And I wrote them that way on purpose. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. I just, I'm so disinterested in any climate change policy because it's just another front for big government getting involved in my life. Yes, I can see how that comes across as um, a problem, but how do you see the role of local communities then addressing an issue as big as climate change that really does have a potentially global impact but that can really be felt locally? I do think that perhaps local communities could take action. I just, I'm always afraid of runaway government. You give them an inch, they always take a mile. Well, I can, yes, I completely see where you're coming from on that. I think that that's a really important thing to keep in mind when developing these type of policies. But, you know, what are some ways then that you could um, suggest or that you've thought about in terms of climate change and the role that government plays in addressing that problem? Are there things that you have thought about or that you could... Um, help propose or, or reframe in that way? Well, I don't actually believe in climate change, um, but I have been attending a lot of city zoning meetings, and I am really interested in engaging Well, cities are a great place to start, you know. Um, as much as um, climate is a big issue, it can start with something as small as the type of buildings that we're building. And um, I think that that's a great place to start. Awesome. <laughs> All right, can we bring it back? And I'd like, <laughs> I'd like to hear a report from a couple of you on what uh, <laughs> what your shared values were, what your proposed frame was, and what your response was. People can buy gas no matter what. So I'll just I'll just let you guys pick. We have time for maybe one or two to hear from. Um, who would like to tell me which question you picked? what your, your shared values were, and what your response was. Anybody willing to share? It's okay if you feel shy. Okay, thank you. So we did um, big government and any state yep. to do, and I had no idea how to respond to that. Um, but then I remember that you said maybe ask questions, and so I asked, what has government done that you've benefited from and liked? Anyway, that questioning, like if you have no idea what to say, asking them for more information. Right? right. It's right always okay that. to say, tell me more. Yeah. That's okay. Right? And keep, and in that, you're continually searching for where can I agree with something because I haven't heard anything yet that I agree with. <laughs> but until you hear something that you agree with, you're not going to go on. Yeah. So, so it's okay to say why before you say yes? Sure, of course. Like, why do you feel that way? Or yeah. I can see your, I, I understand your point, but can you? on that because I, I was we were she was doing a really good job of being very 
I was like, I have no idea what to say to that. I kept wanting to say why, but I wasn't sure if the why, I guess you did say search for yeah. that common ground. So, yeah. okay, thank you. Yeah, and if it really looks hopeless, you know, who are you hoping wins the game on Thursday? <laughs> <laughs> Right? Any, anything is better than just giving them the know you're wrong answer. That, that moves you backwards. So which one did you pick? Which one did we pick? Which question did you pick? Um, government, big government, the Navy okay. state. She was telling me about her teacher, who's ultra, ultra conservative, and I was just like, wow, wow, wow. I, I can't even think of a why. why? Okay, cool. So I don't think it's always the case that there will easily be something you can agree with, but I wrote these questions and I wrote them on purpose, for me anyway, so that there's something in each of those objections that I can find to agree with. Right? I agree that we need to work on the international emissions scene. I agree that I'm afraid of big government dictating solutions to individual citizens. I agree that we need to worry about economic health in the process, and I agree that we need to protect the poor in whatever we do about climate change. All of those are fairly easy for me to find agreement with. Great. Thank you, Tom. Uh, we're gonna move on to the third strategic concept so that we don't run out of time here, which is really about strategy. Um, we all know that a well-planned strategy can be ideal, and that a flexible strategy can be particularly ideal because there are so many facets of a strategy and there's so many changing parts. So I really wanted to ask the panelists here, what are some of the critical pieces of the HCR7 strategy that we used? So I can start with this one. Um, you know, one of the things that we were very cognizant of in terms of, kind of this goes to the messenger again, um, that the, our legislature really listens to very, um, with an intent ear, is the business community and kind of what the business community wants. And so um, HEAL really took it on, along with Action Utah and um, CCL, we took it on as um, an important piece to get some businesses that the legislature cares what they think um, on board and providing their public support. And um, kind of Tom mentioned this before, it kind of gets to the who goes first and trying to get that first business on board, that first person that's willing to say, okay, we see the benefit, we see the value in what is trying to be accomplished here. And as a business community, we either don't see this as threatening or we see this as an opportunity to take it, you know, make advancements in some area that we are wanting to as either a company or it could potentially help our bottom line, whatever the, the and goal is it kind of doesn't matter at that point. At least for us, it didn't matter whether it was you know them making more money or them just wanting to come out, come out and support a community effort that was something positive in the community. And so we had companies like Rocky Mountain Power, the Utah Technology Council, Garbet Homes. Those are all three companies that and um, trade organizations that came out in public and spoke in front of the committee in support of the resolution. So one of our, uh, the things we're good at as CCL is uh, engaging individual constituents. If you want a whole bunch of phone calls generated to some legislators, we can make that happen. And one thing that, that uh, was made very clear to us by Becky Edwards when this bill was in committee was that they do not need, this was the Natural Resources Committee that Jesse mentioned, a rural legislator from Vernal does not need 30 phone calls from people in Salt Lake City telling them how to vote on this bill. So she said, calls from constituents in their district only or don't bother. So it was, okay, who do we have in Vernal? <laughs> okay, we got one person. Can we get that person to call their legislator? Yes. Well, guess what? That legislator's never had a call from a constituent before about climate change. It's actually a really big deal. So when we finally got to the Senate Natural Resources Committee, the swing vote, the, the one that we thought was the swing vote there was from Ogden, and we have a lot of people in his district. So we generated so many phone calls to him <laughs> that he said, I'll vote for your bill, but only if you tell everybody to stop calling me. <laughs> Power of <the> people. <laughs> what else was there? Um, I, just to quickly mention, 
mention, um, in May of 2017, uh, us high school students led the Utah People's Climate March with a painted banner of our climate resolution. And it may be hard to see how this is associated with strategy. But doing this and participating in a protest or march was a calculated risk. On one hand, marching may alienate our legislators by appearing confrontational, but ultimately we viewed it as worthwhile for some critical reasons. It was a valuable opportunity to engage a broader constituency in our efforts. The march prioritized engaging Latinx, indigenous, and frontline communities. If you want to pass a policy that truly reflects the will of the people, you need to ensure that as many folks as possible have an opportunity to participate in the process. Not everyone has the time or comfort to attend legislative hearings, but many people can march. And one other thing that we kind of focused on too and that we're really cognizant of during the process was the role that the media played and could play. And we could either utilize that to our advantage or if the message kind of got out in a different way, it could have worked against us. And so we were really cognizant about keeping this actually pretty quiet for the most part during the actual, um, you know, kind of discussion and um, passing of the bill or the work that we were doing at the legislature during the session. We really tried to keep that messaging um, in the media for something after the session was over. Once it had either passed, well, once it had passed or it had, got, it had failed, then we could kind of use that media strategy to blow up whatever happened. Um, but we, we placed some pretty well-timed um, LTEs and op-eds, and Tom was involved in helping to get um, some of those written and um, published, as was Andrea. And um, it really ended up working in our favor to kind of keep it on the quiet, um, because again, that messaging, those messengers were really an important piece of um, the full strategy of getting this resolution passed. Awesome, okay. Any others you wanna mention while we're at it? No, okay. So we talked about business partners and support. We talked about turning on and off community mobilization, about doing marches or rallies, about how you use PR and the media and whether it's quiet or loud. Um, what are some of the other strategies that you guys can throw out potentially for working on a community initiative, on a policy initiative? Is there anything else you want to add to this list? Does anybody ever lobby legislators and create kind of a lobbying uh, strategy, for instance. Um, there can be community education or legislator education. Um, what are some of the others? Anybody have any thoughts? Yeah. Uh, media education. Mm, good one. So we, a lot of people don't realize you can actually go to the media and give them a presentation on a subject. People don't realize that we can do that. And, and actually reporters like that because they don't have the time to go do the research. So if you actually prepare a presentation, have the resources, present it to them, and so your way you're front loading them for the message you want them to give in the future. Right. So where, where would you, where, where, how would you, how would I direct a student to do that? Do they just call up the, the TV station? Well, I think maybe, well, so I, I'm, I'm with Utah Moms for Clean Air. Yeah. So I think as an organization, I maybe have a little more um, clout or capacity um, because I represent an organization. So as a student, that might be a little bit more difficult. Well, who do you call? What do you mean, who do I call? If you want to if you want to make a presentation. So I just call like, um, you have like Jennifer people? Napier Pierce, for example, yeah. um, who's the current editor of the Tribune. So. Um, and she works for KUED as well. Uh, I'm not sure, I think she's just the, I'm not sure. I know she's the, I know she's the, um, she's the person you want to talk to with the trip. I don't know Ed editorial doing. boards in general yeah, editorial board will be too. very open to um, hearing messages from anyone. You know, they, they, depending on their time and kind of what's going on, there's a timing component to it. But there, we do this a lot with even some of the other issues that we work on. Um, we'll go and brief them and say, hey, these are some things that are coming up that we want you to be aware of so that when you do start to see other action being taken in the community, you do have that context and that background. So do you just call them up? Yeah, you can just call. email them or email them. Yep. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And they're, I mean, they're, they are people <laughs> and they will respond generally. <laughs> they also hold some meet and greets throughout the year so you can kind of come as a group or you know, mm -hmm. as part of other community members going to meet with them. 
Really? Editorial boards have been our main focus as well, but we've also met with individual reporters who are covering that issue area. Just, hey, can we have a meeting? Yeah. What works what, for you, and let's talk about what we're doing. And Yeah. What we try to do uh, you know, in, the, in the Arts College is to get, especially when we're teaching writing, is to uh, learn how to write things like this. I, I'm assuming it's not going to be like you know a thousand words. Of, you know, it's got to be really concise, right? And 600 so, to be. <laughs> 600. Not that. Right. So <laughs> this is this is literally this is exactly what we need to know, about, uh -huh. right? So that when you say to a student, you know, well, why your student asks, well, why am I doing this? Why am I writing about this? And say, uh, just <laughs> knock out 600 words. Here's the ed editorial boards of you know these different media outlets. Send it over to them. Right, so then all of a sudden they go, oh, I, I can do that. I, that's another, another thing that I don't think citizens and students understand, and maybe professors as well. We don't, they, they don't understand that students, that organizations can just do that. Mm -hmm. And we can, we can actually just call people up. 300 words and have a letter to the editor, so it's even smaller of a yeah. commitment, and yeah. anyone can do that anytime. You don't have to be a professional or an expert. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so thank you for those thoughts. Oh, you want to add one more? Thing? Yes, I, I, I've had the opportunity to be a connection person for the Deseret News, the largest writer center uh, uh, newspaper in, in the state. And we we have met with the editorial board. We uh, were surprised that Doug Wilkes himself, the editor, met with us, and they're very receptive. And we've had actually several meetings and such, and, and those relationships really count. Absolutely, relationships count. That's a really important statement. <laughs> um, okay, um, in, the, uh, in the effort to stay on time here, let's move on just a little bit. Um, let's talk about mistakes. We all make them. Um, even probably in our practice today, we thought, oh, I shouldn't have said that. You know, it's okay. We all make mistakes. We all have some failures. We all encounter some obstacles. And so the opportunity is there to learn from them and to improve from them. So I wanted to hear from the panel about some of the mistakes some of the failures that we had along the way and uh, how you overcame them or learned from them. Um, a mistake per se that we've learned, I would say more just like the great learning opportunity was that you don't always get the messenger right the first time. Sometimes you pick a messenger and it just doesn't quite land and <laughs> that's okay. Um, so we kind of, we discovered that when we first introduced our resolution, we were extremely fortunate to get it sponsored by Senator Jim Jabakis. And if any of you are familiar with him, he is a very outspoken and probably the most liberal senator in the state. Um, and we found though that ultimately our resolution was not making as much headway um, until we were, it did not make as much headway until we were able to get a conservative legislature. For the work we were trying to do, we just realized that that was essential. Um, but it's important to stress that even when you don't fully make the mark, you can still get great benefits from those little mistakes. Because Senator Debacus was instrumental in getting our resolution off the ground. He had the courage to take us seriously and help us get our efforts off the ground, and he garnered a lot of publicity for us, helping us hold a mock hearing for our resolution that was viewed by over 15,000 people on Facebook Live and got statewide news coverage. So as we talked about this, like, you know, what were the mistakes you can point to that we made along the way? I mean, first of all, it's a miracle that we got the thing passed. So. <laughs> But uh, we, the, the mistake I can point to is we did so much talking to Republicans and vote counting among Republicans that we really overlooked the talking to and vote counting among Democrats. And uh, I was starting to feel really good about myself, feeling like Bradley Whitford on the West Wing. <laughs> like, oh yeah, we got the votes in the House, I got this. When we got to the Senate, and it was uh, it brought to the floor, and we had our Senate co-sponsor, Senator Todd Weiler from Bountiful, speak in favor of it. The next thing that happened was that Jim Devakis stood up and spoke against it. Our former sponsor. Our former sponsor, and he said, this is an embarrassment, it's been too watered down, and I can't support this anymore. And I said, oh, no. <laughs> so we ended up losing, in the Senate, three Democratic votes. But what I didn't know was that the power dynamics of the Utah Senate are such that when Todd Weiler speaks in favor of something and Jim DeBacchus speaks against it, <laughs> that, means, that means you're good to go. <laughs> so, 
So, so we got about 10 votes among Republicans in Utah County that I was not counting on because of that. Well, yeah, and that kind of goes um, to the wording of the resolution itself. You know, Jim DeBacchus had said that he thought that the resolution had been watered down. And to a degree, like I had mentioned previously, we did have to water it down. We did have to change the wording of the re original resolution from climate change to a changing climate for that very reason. One of the other things I think that um, ultimately helped it pass, but in hindsight, you know, I'm a little sad that this had to be taken out, but it was part of the whole strategy is the, the links between climate change and health. That was in a kind of a, a nuanced and um, what I thought was an important piece of the resolution was linking kind of what is happening to our climate and how it's going to impact the health of people. But in order to get the governor's office on board, and I think to get the, ultimately the Republican vote on this issue, that was kind of an important piece that they didn't want that direct link made, which is kind of an interesting other political side to all of this. So it, it wasn't necessarily a mistake to take it out, but we hope that going forward it doesn't impact what kind of the foundation that was laid that will then allow other things to happen in the future. And I think that we're at the point now where it's not a critical piece of the, of the legislation, but at the time I was like, ah, this important piece is getting taken out. What is gonna happen? This isn't, this is all, like it's not gonna do anything. <laughs> but <laughs> it all is working in our favor, so. When they have the adage uh, in writing, kill your darlings now, <laughs> this was like so, there were some painful points, but yeah, it's really retained. Thank you. Uh, so we have just a couple, oh, go ahead. Have you thought about calling it what it really is? The what? climate has been changing for many years, and now it needs to go to what it really is, and that's a climate crisis. We're in deep trouble, and we need to do something, or we may as well wipe out the mother of There was definitely no way at the time that we were going to call it the climate crisis <laughs> resolution. <laughs> Rather pass it. But uh, and in the way we refer to it now, I mean, it's called the Economic and Environmental Stewardship Resolution. We all call it the climate resolution. Absolutely, and I mean, Tom, you're so good at these types of conversations that we have to make the balance, right, of speaking to people on both sides of the aisle about this. People who don't see it as a crisis, people who do. So the point we made earlier is how do you speak to somebody who doesn't view it as a climate crisis? How do you address somebody who really does, you know? Right, well, so, I mean, in our case, we need to build it step by step. We can't from minute one start screaming climate crisis. It is, I recognize that. We have to do something about it as quickly as possible, and this is a huge step along the way towards doing something about it as quickly as possible. Well, and I think it's important to recognize there are things happening on the ground here in Salt Lake City with big political players that is starting to reference the resolution as something directly related to climate, and so I think it, it, it did become a foundational piece of, of legislation that is getting built upon. It's just right now happening kind of in the backroom discussions, which is really where a lot of things happen in Utah. So it's, it's, it's making its way into the channels that it needs to, to do so. So another question for you guys as a panel. This was a grand exercise in intergenerational bridge building, right? And one that started and ended with this group of high schoolers that Piper led out, um, who, you know, partly by choice and partly by chance, ended up partnering with all of us and a couple other organizations um, as allies who convinced this Republican state legislature to pass the first climate resolution ever in a red state in America. What is your biggest takeaway from this experience with intergenerational bridge building at HCR, in HCR 7? If you've got students like Piper and the other kids at Logan High School, yeah, you should take full advantage of that. <laughs> um, I think a lot of uh, adults ask how they can similarly engage students. And it's so amazing because I'm looking across a room of like former professors and mentors who have been so essential in my own climate journey. Um, and I would say the biggest thing that's helped me is um, 
don't give me a task and tell me how to carry out. Give me a goal and then just let me come up with how to so for our Climate Solutions Caucus, where 30 students went and had conversations with legislators, there was a lot of apprehension about putting 16-year-olds in front of you know, vernal legislators. Like, what are they gonna say? Um, but we step up to the plate if you give us an opportunity to really live up to expectations. Yeah, and I would say the biggest lesson for me in all of this, especially at the time, it being, like I said, my first legislative session and I didn't have a whole lot of experience to draw on, um, is that don't underestimate, don't underestimate the students and the message that they carry, don't underestimate the goal of actually accomplishing something that's difficult, and don't underestimate having a good strategy and actually being able to carry it out and do the hard work to, to reach that goal. Um, I think that this was all a huge lesson for me and for all of us that worked on this, that you can accomplish really difficult things if you give yourself the time and the patience and you just keep coming back at it. Okay, so we have some time for question and answer, but as you're considering what questions you want to ask the panelists, I would be remiss not to point out someone who's very quietly sitting in the back of the room who has also been instrumental to this effort. It's Representative Joel Briscoe. Can you wave back there? Joel Briscoe. Carrying forward this resolution after it initially failed, um, in 2017 was a co-sponsor on the resolution and brought it back to life and has been a champion on this ever effort ever since. So thank you for your energy, your encouragement, your support, your passion, um, and your belief that this could move forward. And then I think I also see hiding in the back another, another wonderful legislator who's been fantastic on these issues is Representative Romero. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So what questions do you all have for the panelists um, before we let them go? Let me pass this around. You go ahead first. Um, could you tell us if you approached the dominant religion and how that worked out? Jesse? Yes. Um, as a matter of fact, actually, I wish Carrie were here because she was the one that really was instrumental in doing this. But. Um, we did reach out to a man named Marty Stevens, who was formerly involved in the Utah legislature and now works for the church. I think he's in charge of their PR um, effort. He's or, the chief lobbyist. Oh, mm -hmm. okay, chief lobbyist. Mm -hmm. um, I did not personally meet with him, but Carrie did. And Carrie was instrumental in getting it on their radar. The LDS church did consider putting out a statement in support, or at least not against the resolution. It did not end up happening. Um, there was a, there's a lot of um, going up the chain, talking to the right people, getting it approved at different levels. And ultimately it didn't happen, but I think that the ability to, for them to even come to the table and have the conversation is very reflective of the, um, the way that they're willing to engage with the community and recognize that their church members are, do care about these issues. And so it was something that, um, ultimately didn't make a public statement, but I think, like I said, we went to the church website when we were writing the resolution and took the language from their statement on environmental stewardship directly. So there are a lot of ties within that, and I think that hopefully going forward we'll see some more engagement from the church. And I think that uh, being in those conversations, the enthusiasm and encouragement and support that we felt was really strong, and it's very difficult for the church to come out on all issues, and they, they come out on very few issues, but um, it was a great conversation that we had, and they really appreciated that we were working on environmental stewardship. So I wanted to ask you, um, just to provide a summary for everyone of what's happened since the resolution has passed. Thank you. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> um, so this was really the big thing hanging in the air after it because we had to make so many of those concessions. And for me, I would have loved to have put climate crisis and that kind of language in. But we really thought we can just get this passed. We don't really know what's possible, but let's just try to get it passed. And in the next year, it was extraordinary seeing all of the little like events that happened that had some association with our resolution. Um, first, and you can kind of fact check if I am phrasing it correctly, but um, the Gardner Policy Institute at University of Utah um, received a grant to do a um, 
climate change adaptation plan for the state of Utah. Um, I've been fortunate to be engaged in that process and um, they're working with a lot of experts throughout the state to kind of create a plan. And that gained money and um, support from the state legislature and at the top of that plan it references our resolution as what kind of got the ball rolling for that effort. Um, in addition to that, um, we, Joel Briscoe, we've been fortunate to have um, a carbon tax um, introduced in our state legislature. Um, it was the first time we had a bipartisan co-sponsorship of a carbon tax in the country. Um, and so, and what we see at the national level is that when we, with Simpsons Climate Lobby, go and speak to our congressional representatives, Mitt Romney and others, Utah is on their radar. We set an indication to the whole country that bipartisan conversations on climate change are possible. And we've had folks from all over the country, Princeton, from uh, small high schools in Idaho, every corner of this country, trying to do similar efforts. So while we kind of took a risk and had to make some sacrifices along the way, I am proud of what we accomplished. Well, I've, been, I've been attending the Gardner Institute meetings and in those meetings, multiple times they've read out loud from the resolution saying this, this is what the legislature has instructed us to do. Right? These, these are the boundaries, these are the parameters, this is what we have permission to explore. This is now official policy of the state. I was also uh, a panelist on, uh, uh, for the Governor's Energy Summit last year. And same thing, they read out loud from the resolution saying this is the policy of the state of Utah that we're talking about climate change. So huge, huge openings of doors. Yeah, and like I said, there are starting to be other meetings of um, big political players in the state figuring out what we're going to do on it. You know, how can we take action at the local level? How can we, kind of Tom alludes to this with his work with the Citizen Climate Lobby, but how do we give our federal delegation cover? and the permission to be able to go and make those decisions at the federal level where you know we all kind of know it really needs to be made. But how, how do we give them that permission by the work that we're doing at the state level and even at the local level in our communities and in our cities? Um, one of the things that has come from this as well is um, you know Salt Lake City had a commitment to um, going 100% renewable by, or yeah, 2030, is that right? And um, there's a bill passed last year in the session that is going to allow them to work with um, Rocky Mountain Power that is going to figure out how to do that. You know, Rocky Mountain Power originally, even though they supported the resolution, when it comes down to changing their service and what, how they're providing energy to their customers, they don't really like being told what to do. However, this resolution, uh, or this uh, new legislation is authorizing the Utah Public Service Commission to set up the rules that allows that to happen. So, you know, while it may not be directly because of the resolution, that's in the background, kind of laying the groundwork for additional policy to be passed and to really see those differences made on the ground. Okay. Other questions? Can I, can I share a footnote regarding the question of the, regarding the response to the of religion, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? We can see uh, within a month of after that resolution passed, there's the posting on the website, by honoring creation, we honor the creator, a very positive statement by the church officially about the environment and uh, taking care of it. And the second issue is the church owned newspaper, the Deseret News, uh, has published, uh, by my count, at least 25 positive editorials regarding related to climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, varying from lukewarm to very positive, specific, uh, stating it is a moral obligation to address climate change. I think that's the difference. That's great. So I just have to stress, what this kind of shows is um, a lot of what this succeeded in doing was just bringing the right people to the table, bringing in businesses, bringing in um, church leadership, bringing in students and legislators. And when those people start to collaborate, that's when some of these amazing things um, as I walk over here to see if anybody else wants to answer, uh, ask a question. What about the term climate change? How has that changed in this state using that terminology? I was at a, a Path to Positive event last week, which had uh, the Speaker of the Utah House and Senator Mitt Romney and uh, a whole bunch of business leaders. 
and it was really noteworthy to me that not a single person said a changing climate <laughs> in that whole presentation. Every single person who spoke said climate change. <laughs> Progress. <laughs> <laughs> that was a temporary workaround for one year. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Um, Piper kind of talked on this, but have you seen this resolution echo throughout other states? And have you been involved with any other resolutions passing in other state legislatures? Or has your language been used at all? Um, what I've been really excited about, as I mentioned, um, at a conference this summer, I met students from a high school in Moscow, Idaho, who said, "We want to. We want to. We're also in a conservative state. We're interested in what you're doing." And I've been in contact with them, talking about how we can introduce a similar resolution. Um, and um, there's been a lot of different. And it's the exciting thing is most of the people who reach out are students. So um, even if it's not at the state legislature, I talk to a lot of kids who just want to introduce something in their city council or something like that. So um, that's been really the most positive thing I've seen is the way that students saw that this is possible and that um, it's not only convenient to have students engaged, it's essential. Mm -hmm. so. I think this has been a really productive conversation and really appreciate all the thoughts from the panel, um, the input from the audience. Uh, I just wanted to say a couple of last words. Uh, we've talked about how a lot of environmentalists and progressives have criticized this uh, measure as being watered down or not going far enough. But then we've also discussed how it has led to all kinds of important conversations happening around the state with major leaders and decision makers who are moving forward with climate action and climate progress bit by bit. And so in a way, this was a baby step for our state um, for our climate solutions in this state, and in another sense, it was a giant leap forward. And so I think it's really important to recognize the, that baby steps are a significant part of making giant leaps, um, and that this particular giant leap that's happened um, wouldn't have occurred without HCR 7, and that HCR 7 wouldn't have happened if we hadn't come together across multiple generations to listen to and empower our youth. So um, I hope this has been helpful to all of you. Thank you to our event sponsors, Citizens Climate Lobby, Heal Utah, Action Utah, to our panelists for their wisdom and ideas, to all of you for being here. We wish you all the best for your endeavors to make an impact on climate solutions. Thanks a lot.